Two years ago, an ash cloud from an Icelandic volcano paralyzed northern Europe. But was this just a freak event, or could it happen again? I'm traveling to the source of the ash cloud to find out. I'll be meeting the scientists who are monitoring the biggest volcanic threats. I'll descend deep underground to discover the effects of tectonic activity. And I'll meet the people who live and work in the most volcanically active country on Earth. We may not have any active volcanoes in Britain, but we're not immune to their effects. What can we learn from Iceland about living with volcanoes? large-scale natural disasters are something that happen in other countries less safe and benign than ours. But in 2010, something happened to remind us that we're not immune from the forces of nature. A volcano erupted over a thousand miles away in Iceland, but in a matter of hours it brought our modern, high-tech world to a juddering halt. For the first time in British aviation history, all flights in and out of the UK have been cancelled. 10 million flights pass through European airspace every year. At Heathrow alone, they deal with over a thousand planes a day. Air traffic controller Jonathan Astle was on duty the day the ash cloud arrived. We know that putting volcanic ash through an engine of an aircraft is a bad thing to do. In this case, it was very much like glass, which if you throw a box full of bottles through an aircraft engine, that's not going to be good. It's going to melt, it's going to you know, really do some serious damage. In a matter of hours, European aviation authorities were forced to shut the skies. I've never worked so hard for so few aircraft flying. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, and at one point, it felt like it would never end. Icelandic eruptions bring Europe to a standstill. So what was it that made this one so disruptive? And most importantly, could it happen again? To find out, I'm heading for the country where all this began. fire and ice and I was trying to avoid using that term but when you're up here looking at it that's exactly what it is the scale of this landscape is just astonishing nature's had a field day on this island I'm on my way to the site of the 2010 eruption to see what it looks like two years on. Well, this is it. This is the culprit, Ea Fieta Jokul. We're flying directly around the crater now. Oh, you can smell the sulphur in the air. And it's strange, I thought that there would be somehow more evidence that the landscape would still be blackened. I mean, there was tons and tons, untold amounts of ash that poured out of this crater. And yet now there's so little sign of it up here. And it looks so benign and so beautiful now. A great shining, pure, white glacier. It's just an incredible sight. Mm -hmm. 
The eruption was on a scale that we hadn't seen in living memory. No one died in 2010, but as events unfolded, the Icelandic president had a stark warning for the rest of the world. Unfortunately, what we have seen in the last few days could only be a beginning of an experience which might be repeated throughout the 21st century because the scientific evidence points towards larger eruptions in the near future. So I think we should, all of us throughout Europe and the world, start planning in a calm and rational way for that eventuality. If there are bigger eruptions to come, I want to know when they might arrive and what the consequences could be for both Iceland and Europe. So from Eyjafjallajökull, Jokul, I'm setting out to visit a few of Iceland's 15 other active volcanoes, some of which have produced big eruptions in the past and others which threaten to erupt again in the near future. Since Iceland was settled just over a thousand years ago, on average there's been a volcanic eruption every five years. And one of the biggest and most devastating of those eruptions has changed the landscape of one corner of Iceland forever. I think this is the strangest, most otherworldly landscape I've ever seen. It's just great chaotic lumps and piles of rock covered in this thick khaki grey moss. It's just weird. It's almost as if some giant crumbled up pieces of cake all over the plains and they've gone mouldy. This lumpy plain was formed in 1783 by an enormous eruption from a volcanic fissure called Laki. At over 20 kilometers wide, it's part of the biggest single lava flow on the planet. To hear how it all happened, I'm meeting Hinrik Olafsson, a guide here in southern Iceland. This lava has its origin from Laki and uh, fissures opened. And it took only four days for the lava to run down, about 34 kilometers down to the lowlands. So it's, um, <laughs> you can't imagine how powerful it was. And uh, that was ongoing for eight months. This map shows how the eruption spread from a fissure in the hills and fed two enormous lakes of lava, which expanded across the plain and began to close in on a small farming community. These pictures from Hawaii in 2011 show a fissure eruption in full flow. The lava fountains that burst from this short fissure were up to 50 meters high. It gives some idea of what the eruption in Iceland must have looked like. Although in 1783, the fissure was 25 kilometers long and the fountains of lava were 500 meters high, as tall as skyscrapers. Lava from the fissure spread over a vast area, as far as the eye can see. How do we know so much about this eruption and the effects that it had? Yeah, there was a pastor here in this area. His name was Jón Stengrimsson. And he wrote some uh, description about this eruption, both from the uh, geological side and also from the human side. The pastor described the scene as the lava poured out and made its way towards his village on the coast. He gekk. My companions and I walked towards the fissure. There, a flood of fire flowed with the speed of a great river, swollen from meltwater, on a spring day. 
In the middle of this fiery river, great cliffs and slabs of rock were swept along, tumbling about like large whales swimming, red hot and glowing. As the lava flow advanced towards their homes, the pastor gathered his congregation and gave what has become a famous sermon, known in Iceland as the Fire Mass. He inspired the villagers to face up to their situation without fear. His church was near here. Was it in a village that was eventually engulfed in the lava? Actually, the lava stopped uh, two kilometers from the, from the church where oh. he was holding this great speech uh, called Fire Mass, where he was trying to urge people to carry on and uh, believe on life. Presumably, for the people terrified in the church, they must have looked at their pastor and thought somehow yeah. he had a direct connection to God. Yeah. But lava was only part of the problem. The eruption also produced huge amounts of sulfur dioxide and fluorine, which poisoned the water and contaminated food for people and animals alike. As crops failed and livestock began to die, famine swept across huge swathes of Iceland. 25% of the population of Iceland died because of hunger. And uh, most of the island was totally covered with ash. And there was also a mist. You know, we they har hardly had sunlight for many months. The events of 1783 are an important chapter in Icelandic history. 10,000 people died during the Lucky eruptions. And it's a story which is still taught in school here. The courage shown by the pastor Jörn Steingrimson has also come to symbolize the attitude of Icelanders to the volcanoes around them. Is it something that's still referred to today? Is it still talked about today? Absolutely. It was a huge catastrophe for, I catastrophe for Icelanders. And uh, we have to have this knowledge about it so we can learn and you know, carry on. You are living kind of in the shadow of danger all the time. As an Icelander, is that sense of, of, of potential impending doom always slightly at the back of your mind? No. To be honest, no. If you understand it, if you have, if you respect it, you should not be afraid. So it's quite important for us to know about those things because they will happen again. I can tell you. In 2010, it was a cloud of volcanic ash that made its way to Europe. But in 1783, the continent was engulfed by a huge cloud of sulfur dioxide. If a similar eruption happened again today, that toxic gas could have devastating consequences, particularly in densely populated areas like London. People would start to really struggle to breathe, the air quality would deteriorate dramatically. We'd probably struggle to see St Paul's across the river here. And so I would say that the disaster potentially could be greater in the 21st century than it was in the 18th century. And in the 18th century, they thought it was the end of the world. So you can see that people, it's going to be bad. In the summer months, hot weather and air pollution often combine to reduce air quality in modern cities across Europe. Add volcanic gases to the mix, and the result is a thick fog laced with sulfuric acid. At that point, people with fragile health or breathing problems can really begin to suffer. Professor John Grattan has found evidence in historical records showing that the arrival of volcanic fog from Iceland had similar effects over large swathes of Europe in the 18th century. On the 23rd of June 1783, people across Western Europe woke up to a, to a changed world. There are descriptions of people waking up and looking out their window at the gardens and seeing that their fruit had fallen to the ground. 
forest being stripped of their leaves and there's an intense smell of sulphur in the air. And they say that in the morning and in the evening as the sun rises and sets, it's, it's blood red like a red hot pewter plate. And somebody describes it as, as like a red hot salamander. And people are really, really worried by this. There are very clear descriptions of people struggling to breathe, of an uncomfortable pressure, uh, palpitations of the heart, uh, of mysterious agues and fevers, of outbreaks of, of terrible diarrhea, the bloody flux. That's the summer advances and the smell of sulphur gets more intense, people start to die. People start to die in ones and twos, then in great numbers. There are descriptions of so many farmhands dying in the fields that the farmers were afraid that they wouldn't be able to get their, their harvest in in time before the summer ended. Within the parishes we've looked at in England, we're looking at about 30,000 extra deaths, a, a doubling of the death rate, and it certainly seems to be higher than that in France. Uh, the research so far suggests about 250,000, so we're getting up towards 300,000 you know, that we can be certain of and nothing like that's ever been seen uh, before or frankly since. It's quite natural at this time to invoke uh, God. There are sermons which tell people that we think this is the end of the world, boys and girls, and you better start to uh, take note of your soul. This is Armageddon, and you better take note of it. This was one of the largest eruptions in Icelandic history, but the Earth only sees events of this size every few hundred years. So it may be several generations before we have to face up to problems like this in Europe. The colossal volcanic scar from the Laki eruption now stands as a monument to the lives that were lost. And this is just one of many fissures which cut across this landscape. The fissures in Iceland are part of a network of rifts that cross the entire planet. These are the boundaries between the tectonic plates and they're home to 80% of the world's volcanoes. Iceland straddles one of those plate boundaries where for 50 million years the North American and Eurasian plates have been moving in opposite directions. The results of this violent tug of war are clearly visible in the landscape. As the plates pull apart, magma rises from the Earth's mantle to fill the gap. Millions of years of eruptions have piled lava flow upon lava flow to create an entire country. So the rift that splits this island in two is the birthplace of Iceland itself. And in the future, Iceland will continue to grow, which makes it vital that scientists understand exactly how the process works. Here in the southwest of the country, a recently explored site represents a unique opportunity to study one of these volcanoes not just on the surface, but from the inside. I've come here with Bjorn Odson, a volcanologist who's keen to get a first look at this geological one-off. We're joining a team of mountaineers who are making final preparations for our extraordinary descent. A real-life journey to the center of the Earth. They've rigged up a mechanical lift, which will lower us directly into what was once the fiery mouth of this volcanic vent. I, for one, am slightly apprehensive. Now, 
Now, you've never been down here, either. No, I've never been here. Are you a little bit nervous about this slightly Heath Robinson piece of kit that we're descending no, into I, the I, bowels of the earth in? <laughs> I, I think it will work. I hope so. Oh, I hope so, too. <laughs> Crossing the gantry to the lift feels a little bit like walking the plank, and the gaping hole beneath is impossible to ignore. But finally, we're ready to descend. <laughs> it was not so bad. <laughs> That's my nervous descent. love. Okay, we're getting into a very narrow bit here. It's a strange feeling being slowly swallowed up by the mouth of a volcano. It's a very kind of organic feeling space, this, isn't it? It's, yes. it, it feels almost alive, the, the kind of shapes of the rock. It's just like it happened yesterday. Yeah. And what's amazing, just looking at the walls, yes. is you can kind of see the, the bits of magma kind of left mm -hmm. on the side of the chamber. When it was plastered on the wall, it was not fully solidified, so with time it, it remelts and drops down and Look, freezes. So these sort of chocolate-like drips stuck to the walls, that's the magma, that's the remnants yes, of the magma. Yes, that's the remnants. Gravity pulls it down and forms these candle-like forms. That's incredible. As we descend further, the throat of the volcano begins to widen out. We're lowered into a vast open chamber. From top to bottom, it's 150 meters taller than St. Paul's Cathedral. We're now deep inside the body of this volcano, in a space that would once have flowed with liquid magma. So is this the only place in the world that you know of that you can descend down into a volcano? Yes, as, as I know. And, and uh, this is very special because all the magma has drained away yeah. from here to the surface. So in normal circumstances, this immense cavern that we're standing in now... It would be full of it magma. It would be full of magma. Yes, or, or lava, of course. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I'll tell you what's so extraordinary that I really wasn't expecting was the colour. It's just a riot of every colour you can think of. That's due to many reasons. And uh, Iceland and Icelandic mountains, they are built up with many lava layers and many events of volcanic eruption. Mm -hmm. And we see both ash and lava from different types of volcanic eruptions. So this is like an open book. You can read the story of this mountain. In the damp air of the cave, chemical reactions have changed the colour of the rocks, like the rust on a piece of iron. But as well as a beautiful sight, the colourful shapes in the walls have a greater significance. Like tree rings, the lava layers record the history of eruptions here as they piled up, one on top of another. And running vertically through the walls, this band of black rock marks the feeding channel that supplied magma from deep beneath our feet. What you see here is like a wall of fire. Right. But this is just a wall of fire frozen underground. It cuts across this cave and it runs along the entire length of the fissure underneath the volcanic ridges on the surface which it created a few thousand years ago. And we can see the direction of these lines yeah. is parallel to all the mountain ridges we see on the surface. Most uh, volcanic eruptions in Iceland are, are on fissures. So uh, 
Iceland is pulled apart. And on the one side we see North American plate, on yeah. the other side we see the Eurasian plate. So we're sort of standing in the middle of those two tectonic plates? Yes, of these two continents. Does that mean effectively what we're doing is standing in a kind of no man's land between the two? We are in Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. This volcanic cathedral provides a fascinating new perspective on Iceland's central rift. And research here should help scientists like Bjorn to understand better how the opening of that rift controls Iceland's volcanic activity. The last eruption on this part of the rift was 3,000 years ago. But other parts of the rift have opened up much more recently as the inhabitants of an island just off the south coast of Iceland can testify. This is Heime, and the entrance to its harbour is protected by dark, looming cliffs, a clue to events which rocked this place to its foundations almost 40 years ago. Does this volcano come as a complete surprise to you or did you have any warning? There was no warning whatsoever until 10 o'clock yesterday evening, uh, which was the earthquake. Yeah. Yes. lava entering the sea causes the water to virtually boil and sends clouds of steam thousands of feet up into the air. On the morning of January the 23rd, 1973, a fissure a mile long opened up and split this part of the island in two. Great fiery fountains of lava lit up the night sky, alerting the people in this town that they had to escape and quickly. Today on Heime, evidence of that volcanic eruption is easy to find. This was the stuff that was coming out of that fissure. It is actually a sort of ash, but it's more like gravel, and it was literally raining down. But of course, it wasn't cool, inert stuff like this. It was at about 1,000 degrees Celsius, and this wasn't all that was coming out of that fissure. There were enormous lumps of lava like this. This is called a lava bomb, and these were being thrown out great molten lumps of rock that came thudding into the ground. So to be here when that happened must have felt like being in a living hell. To the 5,000 inhabitants of this tiny island, it felt like the end. The volcano threatened to engulf everything, and although it was a heart-wrenching decision, they knew immediately that they had to leave. It was pure luck that the night the volcano erupted, the harbour was full of fishing boats. And on a normal night, all the men and all the boats would have been out at sea. But there'd been a huge storm the night before that had kept men and boats at home. So when the volcano erupted, suddenly there was a means of escape from what must have seemed at the time an inescapable fate. Most of the population was evacuated to the mainland by boat, but Heimei's natural harbour makes it the most profitable fishing port in the whole of Iceland, and no one was willing to abandon this place for good. Determined to preserve their way of life, about a hundred men stayed behind to try and save as many homes as they could. 
At first, they concentrated on clearing ash, hoping to stop roofs collapsing. But the ash kept falling, and many houses were soon completely buried. Where a whole neighborhood once thrived, just a single chimney now emerges from the ash. After a month, the eruption showed no sign of abating, and a huge lava flow advanced towards the town, consuming everything in its path. And when the lava finally reached the coast, it began to threaten the most valuable part of the island. The harbour entrance in Heime was just a few hundred metres wide. But as lava added new land to the coast, there was a real chance that the gap might be closed forever. For those who had stayed behind, like local welder Halle Trygvason, that was the moment the real fight back began. We knew we had to save the harbour because our livelihood depends on being able to sail out to sea. If we're going to live on this island, we have to be able to fish. Our town and way of life wouldn't last long without the fishing industry. That's just the way it is. It seemed impossible that anything could be done to save the harbour. But something that had happened ten years earlier provided a glimmer of hope. Just a few kilometres from Heimei, an underwater volcano broke the surface in 1963 to create a brand new island called Sertse. As lava flowed into the sea, one volcanologist had watched as it cooled and hardened on contact with the water, creating a barrier which diverted the flows behind it. Ten years later, he realized that what he'd witnessed could be the key to saving Heimei's harbor, and he proposed that they spray seawater directly onto the advancing lava. I was put to work welding pipes together. As soon as we began spraying cold seawater on the lava, it started hardening and gradually heaping up. We noticed that the lava was losing ground and actually being diverted. So everyone was saying, it's working. Spray more on it, spray more. Halle and the rest of the team worked around the clock. A huge network of pipes was put together and extra pumps were shipped in to get water right into the heart of the lava flow. An unbelievable amount of seawater was sprayed onto the lava to try and stop its advance. Huge amounts, constantly. I have no idea how much, but it would be fun to know. Incredibly, cooled by the water, a huge barrier of solidified lava was built up alongside the harbour. This new wall of rock stopped the lava flow 200 metres short of the cliffs on the far side. Today, that gap remains and access to the harbour has been preserved. By taking on the volcano, the people of Heimei had maintained their livelihood. And to this day, they continue to harvest the rich fishing grounds of the northern Atlantic. It must have been a really fantastic feeling that somehow, against all odds, you were doing it. A volcano isn't exactly an ordinary kind of adversary, not at all. So it was amazing to see our plan actually working. It's incredible that we were able to stop the lava and save our town as well as our harbour. It was miraculous. It just worked. By standing up to the eruption, the people of Heimei had shown a typically Icelandic resilience to the volcanoes around them. As Iceland's Prime Minister told me, the people of all of Iceland live with fire beneath their feet. 
It was a life-changing event for the population of this island. But as with the vast majority of Icelandic eruptions, only a small area was affected. When Eyjafjallajökull erupted in 2010, the effects extended way beyond southern Iceland. So what is it about this volcano that made it capable of causing an international incident? To find out, I'm heading to the summit using specially adapted jeeps to cross the glacial ice. Why is it necessary to have such big tyres? Is it just to make you feel a bit more macho? A little bit like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> we climb 1,500 metres before arriving at the crater's edge. Again, I've joined Bjorn Odson, who's part of the team that's made a surprising discovery about the 2010 eruption. We've come as close to the edge of Eyjafjallajökull's main crater as we dare. Beyond here, the walls of this new gash in the ice are extremely unstable, tumbling down to the steaming vent below. So we are standing here on the rim of Eyjafjallajökull volcano, mm -hmm. and we're going to look into the crater with a thermal camera and see the heat that's still generating two years later. When the magma is, is erupted, yeah. it's close to 1100 or 1200 degrees in Celsius. Wow. And with time it cools down and I would guess that just below the surface it's yeah. around boiling point. And several meters down you would find six to 800 degrees in Celsius. Wow. Because it takes a really long time to cool down. Does that mean that the volcano is still sort of in eruption mode, if you like? Could it still go any it, minute? It, it still can go any minute but it'll probably be like this for many years and the core beneath will be warm. Even though we're 1,500 metres up and it's freezing. Yes, even though, <laughs> even though. I think the abiding memory that everybody has of this eruption were those vast towering ash clouds that then got dispersed, not just across Iceland, but all the way to Northern Europe. Why ash? Why did this volcano generate so much ash? Uh, that's due to the volcanic happening uh, under ice. So right. it produced a lot of meltwater mm -hmm. and the interaction between lava and ice breaks up all the, all the lava and forms ash, which is transported into ash plumes and dispersed in the atmosphere. Meltwater in the summit crater interacts with the lava emerging from the vent. The resulting steam explosions rip the magma into tiny fragments, better known as ash. If it would happen on a dry land, yeah. then we would see lava flowing around. Right. But when we mix water and magma, it turns explosive and all the product is, is ash, but not lava. During the eruption, a quarter of a billion cubic metres of ash was blasted high into the atmosphere. Long-lasting high pressure over the Atlantic created strong northerly winds which carried the ash towards continental Europe. In many eruptions, the supply of magma runs out after a couple of days, but not here. In 2010, Ea Fietliokul continued to pump out ash for over a month. What was it that made this eruption go on so long? Was it something particular about this volcano? Um, access of, of, of a huge amount of, of magma. It seems like the, the magma from last eruption has been resting under the volcano. Wow. since 1821. So hang on a second, let me see if I can understand this properly. You're saying that the last eruption here yes. was in 18... 1821. 1821. And 
the magma came up as as we expect up the sort of chimney if you like up mm -hmm. to the to the crater but some of it got sort of stuck on the way yes. went down a kind of little channel or a little tunnel and just sat there yes, yes. and then 2010 you have another great boiling up of of your kind of original mm -hmm. magma if you like at the bottom of the chamber that starts to travel up the old magma kind of wakes up and goes hang on a second what's going on and that comes up with it yes the well, scientists are quite clever aren't you there it is <laughs> <laughs> so when Ea Fietli Yokul came to life once more in 2010 the old magma was stirred up, and it too emerged from the crater, adding to the volume of ash, and extending the eruption for much longer than expected. Is this our picnic? This is our picnic. <laughs> so, during the eruption, all this area was covered by ash. So this would have been black? Uh, all black, several meters. Right. But it's two years in, so we had two year of winter snow. Yeah. So maybe 10, 15 meters of snow on top of it, so we don't see any ash here right now. The ash might all be buried now, but Bjorn has brought a sample with him to explain what it tells us about the eruption. This is the very ash that came out of this volcano in 2010. Yes. Wow. And in the beginning, Yeah. It was these uh, fine-grained ash, so you can feel it in your fingers. It's, it's a little bit muddy. Yeah, yeah. And this is the fine grain that, that gets the highest in the atmosphere and is carried the most way from the volcano. So this would have been the stuff that caused all the disruption in Europe? Yes. Right. And with time it got more coarse-grained, right. the eruption. So it changes with time. Yeah. And this ash here we see, it, it's more like sand and doesn't stick together. Oh, it is. It's completely well. different. It's much grittier, yes, isn't yes. it? Yes, And this is affecting the local more, more than the, the, right. the finer one. Because this would have been too heavy yes. to have been blown to all around. that way. Until 2010, this was considered a dormant volcano. And people had been living and working in its shadow for generations. Helga Haraldsdottir has a small farm beneath Ea Fietle Jokul, and I've come to see how she coped with the eruption here two years ago. So can you um, tell me what happened on that morning uh, when the eruption started? What did you hear and see? We just saw this big, big gushes of ash coming up and going east over the mountains. So it was at that point it was going away from you? Yes, it was going away. And we immediately started to prepare, trying to tighten all the houses, getting animals inside, and prepare for it. Helga's photographs, taken when the eruption began, show westerly winds taking the ash away from her land. But after just two days, the winds swung around to bring the ash cloud straight towards her farm. This big, dark brownish cloud getting up probably three, four kilometers higher and just coming crawling down here the hills. So it was sweeping down Yeah, it came across sweeping here. down from the glacier. Yeah. And in the end, we just disappeared into it. Everything was pitch black and we didn't see anything. Even though you understood what it was, it must still have been quite frightening. Yes, it was. You, you, you really don't know what to expect. Yeah. You never know how you're going to react to it, really. It was just like... Christmas snowing, except it was black. It was not that heavy, but it was like a fine, fine sand got into your eyes, into your mouth. I mean, it sounds uh, perhaps a, a, a rude question, but did you not think that buying a farm sort of right underneath a volcano was possibly unwise? No, I don't <laughs> think so. I don't think anybody 
considered Eyjafjalla Jökull as an active volcano. Really? It had an erupted for 200 years and we so didn't really you think it would go off. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't your first reaction just to run away? I mean, what did you do? No, my first reaction was get all the horses inside. <laughs> <laughs> we were getting everything inside and uh, well, it was that close. We were putting the last horse ass inside the door when heaven falls upon us. Was it covered in ash? It was absolutely pitch black, everything. It was from five centimeters thick. And then as it went closer to the volcano, it just got thicker and thicker. Helga and her family, along with the other local farmers, were evacuated. They could only visit once a day to feed their animals and had to wear masks to keep out the ash. The eruption had come at the worst possible moment because April here is the start of the lambing season. It's a part of the year that can be stressful at the best of times. But for Helga in 2010, it was a nightmare. Even with the animals inside, the thick ash cloud still crept in through windows and doors. Did you notice any adverse health effects from this ash on you or, or indeed your animals? I couldn't see any on the adult animals, but we lost the first six or seven lambs. Wow. So I think it was just the ash, amount of ash in the air was too much for them. When I always slaughter some lambs in the autumn mm -hmm. and I noticed they had black spots in the lungs. Some tiny, tiny, another larger one. Then I killed one, a two-year-old, mm -hmm. and she had brownish stripes in her lungs, as big as the, thick as the, my finger, wow. just going through the lungs. Are you worried that, you know, given the state of your sheep's lungs, that your lungs might not be so great either? Yeah, I think I got some ash down there, but... <laughs> You're coping. Yeah. <laughs> I can then use it as an excuse when I can't run anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so once this ash cloud had passed, what were you left with? What did the farm look like? Well, everything was kind of in greyish, dark colours. We had about five to seven centimetres thick ash over everything. Then when it rained, it got into this disgusting mud. Oh. And then when it dried up again, it was just like a concrete over everything. What did you think you could do? Nothing. You couldn't do anything. You just have to wait and see what will happen. And we took the point early on that we're just going to try to stick with it, see how it goes. But we were not going to throw in the towel yet. So what happened to all the ash? I mean, did you literally have to sort of scrape no, it up? No, 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 no. It's just sitting under the grass. Yeah. Yep. Looking at the area around the farm now, it's hard to believe it was once blanketed by thick black ash. That's the pumpkin man. God, it is beautiful here. Yes, it is. Oh, look at your lambs. Bro, you have to get a lot done. This year's lambing season has just begun, and life on Helga's farm has returned to normal. Have these just been born? They look very young. Yes. Oh, they are adorable. Have you ever thought, actually, I just want to move? No, no. It's the best spot in Iceland. Really? Yes, it's, it's way, way colder, <laughs> just 10 kilometers to the east or west over the winter. So it's the best spot in Iceland. And if Eyjafjallajökull was to decide to erupt again next year, would you still feel the same? Yes, I think so. I would just be a little bit more prepared what to do. <laughs> <laughs> the people of Iceland have had to live with volcanic eruptions since the country was settled in the 9th century. Since then, there's been a pattern, a peak in the level of activity which comes every 140 years. Scientists believe that the next peak could come as soon as 2030. 
but events over the last couple of years suggest that things might have already begun to pick up. In March 2010, there was a spectacular lava eruption just a few kilometers from Ea Fietliokul. In May 2011, another explosive eruption happened at a volcano called Grimsvotten. And later the same year, there was a burst of geothermal activity beneath the glacier at Katla, one of Iceland's biggest volcanoes. Now that geothermal activity heated up the ice and caused a flood of water to come pouring off the volcano and down this river valley, taking out the bridge and causing mass devastation as it made its way to the sea. Katla is just 20 kilometers from Ea Fietliokul, but it's much, much bigger. And in Iceland, many people are worried that an eruption here could be next. The time for Katla to erupt is coming close. I don't say if, but I say when. So I think it is high time for European governments and airline authorities all over Europe and the world to start planning for the eventual Katla eruption. I'm heading for the summit of Katla to see how scientists are using the latest technology to keep a close eye on this volcanic giant. Crossing the vast summit ice cap, we're joined by Dr. Benny O'Fakeson, the man in charge of monitoring efforts here on Katla. He leads us to a rocky outcrop rising out of the icy plain, the highest point for miles around. We are actually at the edge of the caldera rim. Right. The caldera is a depression that is formed when a magma chamber is emptied. So what we're looking at here is, is snow and ice covering that kind of classic volcano crater. And the caldera stretches in which direction? If you look, look, look around here, we see the edge of the caldera rim. So all the high points? The high points here are at the edge of the caldera rim, all the, all, all the way around. So, I mean, it's absolutely enormous. It's enormous. It's about 10 kilometers diameter. And how thick is the ice on top of it? About 750 meters. Wow. Calderas mark the top of the very biggest volcanoes in the world. And they're formed by what are known as super eruptions. The explosions that created Catlas Caldera several thousand years ago were 50 times bigger than Ea Fietliokul in 2010, depositing ash layers in Russia some 2,000 miles away. Fortunately, not every eruption here is quite that big, but Catla has seen plenty of activity in the last few hundred years. So how active is this volcano? Well, it has been erupting roughly once or twice every century. OK. So the last time it, it had a great eruption? It was in 1918. It was about, well, three times bigger than the Eiffel eruption. In 1918, there was a huge ash eruption at Katla, which also unleashed a torrent of meltwater many times larger than the flood last year. It ripped huge chunks from the glacier and carried them like icebergs towards the coast. That is almost a century ago. Yes. yes. So does that mean it's kind of overdue? Well, I mean, no, I wouldn't say that. I mean, volcanoes aren't overdue. They, they change patterns on a regular basis, or irregular basis, actually. And, they, they are irregular and complex things. It, it might erupt in 10 years, it might erupt in 50 years. It might erupt in a few weeks. <laughs> OK, should we get this job done then? <laughs> the length of time between eruptions at Katla varies a lot, so the only way to anticipate the next episode of activity 
is by carefully monitoring its behavior. Bolted to the rock, these GPS instruments use satellite technology to accurately report their position every second of the day. They show that the surface of this enormous volcano is almost constantly on the move. It looks to the uninitiated eye that it's moving quite a lot. Yes, it is. It is moving quite a lot. What we are looking at now is, is volcanic unrest. And that's sort of a long-term indicator that something is, could potentially happen. And it could potentially happen at short notice. This shifting of the ground is often seen at active volcanoes, but it doesn't necessarily mean an eruption is on the way. What Benny is really looking out for is evidence that shows whether the pressure is building in Catler's magma chamber, deep beneath our feet. How does magma accumulating kilometers below us, presumably, mm -hmm. um, how does that affect a GPS instrument right up here on the surface? If you have a magma chamber below a volcano, yeah. and it's, it's, there is magma coming into that magma chamber, it increases the pressure in, in the magma chamber. So you're basically increasing it in size. Right, so, so you, you it's, it's it, it like would blowing it... up a balloon. So you see it on the surface, okay. you, see, you see an uplift and ah. away. So Benny won't issue any warnings until he sees clear movement up and away from the magma chamber over a period of days or weeks. Only that would suggest that Kattler is building up to a really big eruption. When Catler does erupt again, the consequences could be a lot more serious than the ash cloud that reached us two years ago. In Iceland, the population is well aware of that threat and of the dangers posed by all the other volcanoes around them. I've now met a whole series of locals scientists that are involved in how eruptions work and monitoring the volcanoes and then just the regular people who live alongside them and with the consequences of them and there's a sense of acceptance but not resignation it's very different um, and a sense of this is just who we are and where we are and it's very much part of us. There's a lot we can take from the Icelandic attitude to the volcanoes in their midst. We can't stop volcanic eruptions happening, but we can learn from them. And it's a lesson we should take seriously. Because there is no doubt that Iceland's volcanoes will erupt again. It's just a matter of when.